Okay, so in this set of slides, we're going to continue with support vector machines and in particular address the multi-class issue as well as um, uh, the non-separability non if um, things are not linearly separable. Okay, so let's start with um, uh, the problem where we have classes that overlap and there isn't a linear separator. So I'm going to draw a picture just to the straight. Um, so this would be for data that looks like this. Okay, so let's say that I've got my data. It looks like this, where I have mostly the points on one side, mostly the crosses on the other side. But then you see I've got some crosses that are here, and I've got some points that are here. So he now, if this is my new feature space, right? This is after I've done a, a nonlinear transformation. My data is not linearly separable, and I won't be able to use the optimization problem that we discussed in support vector machine. So the question is, how can we deal with this? OK, so the solution will be to consider what we're going to call soft margin. OK, so. So far, uh, what we've been assuming is that the uh, distance of all the points to our separator should be at least one, and that there would be a margin that would separate our data. But what we could do is relax this, and we're going to relax this by essentially introducing some slack variables. So these variables here are slack variables. Um, I'm going to assume that they're positive. And then you see the idea is that instead of making sure that the distance is going to be greater than 1, it's going to be greater than 1 minus my slack variable, where the slack variable will allow essentially the margin or the distance to be less than 1. OK, so let's draw a picture to illustrate this. OK, so I've got, again, my points on one side, crosses on the other side. And I've drawn here um, the boundaries for, for the margin. So here the margin, again, corresponds to a distance of at least 1. So I'd like to make sure that all my points are at least a distance 1 away from um, my uh, separator. OK, so in fact, here, what we're doing is introducing some slack variables. And what we can show is that the points that are on the margin, they're going to have a slack variable that is equal to 0. Um, 
and then points that are inside the margin, so like this point here, is going to have a slack variable that is between 0 and 1, and then points that are misclassified, like this one, um, here the slack variable is going to be greater than 1. Okay, so here I've looked at the crosses, right? So I've got points that are on the margin, so those two points, they have a slack variable that's exactly 0 because their distance is satisfied, it's at least 1. Now, I've got one point that is inside my margin, so this one has a distance that is less than 1, so in order to satisfy the constraint, I use a slack variable that is going to be between 0 and 1. And then there's another point, this one is even worse, it's misclassified, it's on the wrong side of the separator, so this one is going to need a slack variable that is greater than 1. Okay, so this is what we've got in our optimization problem here. So normally we want that every uh, point has a distance that is greater than 1, but now we can adjust this distance based on, on the slack variable. Okay, when we introduce slack variables though, um, we'll want to make sure that there, we, we make good use of them and, and perhaps here uh, to uh, prevent us from just you know, allowing um, slack variables for everything anywhere, what we can do is introduce a penalty term. Okay, so, so normally we minimize just the magnitude of W but now we're going to add a penalty term that will also minimize the magnitude of those um, slack variables, right? Because this way, you see, I will still try to make sure that my points are a distance of at least one. This will drive the slack variable down to zero, but then if I can't, then it's okay. This will still be feasible, but then I'll pay a price. So in this optimization problem, I also introduce um, a weight C. So here C controls the trade-off between the slack variable penalty and the margin. So the idea is that um, in order to allow soft margins, then I have this penalty, but then I'll have to adjust where my separator ends up and then I won't necessarily want to have the smallest w, so, so here I'll have a trade-off between those two. Okay, any questions regarding this picture and this slide? Okay. All right, so with soft margins, now we obtain a soft margin classifier and what's interesting is that if we take the sum of, the, of those slack variables, uh, it's generally an upper bound on the number of misclassifications. So you see, um, it's those slack variables that would indicate whenever we've got a data point that is inside the margin or even misclassified, and if we simply take the sum, um, we can show that this will give us an upper bound on the number of points that is going to be misclassified. Also, the weight C can be thought as some form of realization coefficient that controls the trade-off between error minimization and model complexity. Right? So what I mean by error minimization is simply minimizing the penalty terms to make sure that I don't misclassify too many points, so this would ensure a good fit to the data, but at the same time, I still want my weights to be as small as possible, and this would correspond to model complexity. Okay, so there's a trade-off between those two, and, and it's just like before when we talked about regularization. Now, if I let C go to infinity, then we recover the original hard margin classifier and you can look at this again. So if C is infinite, then it means that this term is going to be really the term being optimized as opposed to W. So now this is going to force 
all those um, slack variables to be as small as possible, in fact, ideally to be zero. Okay, so, so in the limit when c is infinite, we're essentially making sure that the slack variables are going to be zero if, if this overall has a, a, a finite solution. Okay, and now with the soft margins, we can handle minor classifications, but the classifier is still very sensitive to outliers. So here, if we look again at the picture on the board, right? Um, if I happen to have a point that is misclassified here, um, the problem is that it is so far from the linear separator that we're going to have a slack variable that is going to be very large, so it's going to lead to a very high penalty. And now this high penalty is going to have an impact on where this, um, this linear separator ends up because uh, the optimization will essentially try to minimize overall these types of errors and then chances are our linear separator is going to shift to get closer to that data point. So, so this is problematic because you see um, we introduce slack variables so we could deal with misclassification so that's fine and in general it's going to be okay as long as these are slight misclassification as in being still close to the, the separator. But if the errors come from the fact that when we get our data, um, we have um, uh, some labels that are flipped or that, that, that are changed by mistake, and perhaps these could be for data points that are very far from the separator, then this will in, have an impact on where the separator ends up. So the separator is going to be pulled closer to those data points. So outliers are still a problem. So in other words, soft margin are good for handling misclassifications, but they're not good for handling outliers or severe misclassifications. Okay, any questions regarding this? Yeah. Uh, what is the state of uh, slack variable for, uh, for uh, non uh, Oh, so the non-support vectors, so all of those data points, their slack variable would also be zero, right? Because there the distance is already greater than one and it doesn't matter. Okay, so as before, so we're going to have support vectors that correspond to active constraints. And here, um, the active constraints are going to correspond to all the points that are in the margin or misclassified. Right? So, so here, active constraints correspond to whenever we've got equality as opposed to inequality. Right? So we had an optimization problem subject to some constraints with inequality, but then these constraints are not really active if the distance is already greater than one, but if this distance is one or even less than one, now the, the constraints are going to be active. And, and then so here, again in this picture, so I guess the picture that we have to draw here is the one that I already have on the board, right? So in this picture, all of our support vectors are really going to be um, those points that I circled. So these are all support vectors, and they correspond to the points that have active constraints. So in this case, you see the subset of points where we have active constraint is going to be larger than, than before because we have all the misclassified points or all the points inside the margin. It's still going to be a subset, but perhaps you know, a larger subset than, than before. Okay, so this deals with um, um, misclassification, but now the other problem that we have to look at is what if we have multiple classes? How can we extend support vector machines to work with multiple classes? So historically, there were three approaches that were considered. One of them was called one against all, and then in that uh, approach, you would train K support vector machines, where each one of them was essentially distinguishing between a class and all the other classes. 
Um, another approach known as pairwise comparison, you would train k-square support vector machines for every pair of classes. And then finally, the last one, continuous ranking, you train a single support vector machine, and then what it does is it returns a continuous value to rank all the classes, as opposed to just um, a class uh, based on, on the sign. Okay, so with the return a continuous value, and then you rank um, each class based on those continuous values. So what I'm going to do now is draw some pictures to illustrate how each one of those approaches work, and then we're going to see that there's one in particular that, that is better and has become the de facto approach. Okay, so the first approach, um, one against all, looks like this. Um, Okay, so let's say we've got three classes, A, B, and C. Okay, so now I'm, I'm just drawing some, some circles, so it just means that the, the data is roughly in, in, in these regions. And now if we're going to do one against all, so I could, for instance, train a support vector machine to distinguish A versus the rest. So naturally what will happen is we're going to find a separator that is roughly equal distance between A and the rest. Okay, so, so this will be A on this side and then the rest. Now we can train another one for B. And then there's a third one that we can train for C. Okay, so, so now we have three support vector machines, and now the question is, if I give you a data point, which class would you pick based on those three support vector machines? And for some points, it will be okay. It's gonna be clear what class to pick, but for some other points, it's not so obvious. So for instance, in this region, um, one support vector machine says, this side is A, the other one says this side is C. So if I have a point in here, I've got two support vector machines that are claiming that it should be A and that it should be C. So which class are we going to pick? Right? So we don't have a way of picking a class here. Same thing in this region. So here we have one support vector machine that says it's B, but then this one also says that it's C, so we have a problem. And then here, uh, we have the same problem too. Um, so this one says that it's B, and this one says that it's A, so, so we have a conflict, okay? And now if I give you a point in the middle, what class would you pick for a point in the middle? Okay, so yeah, so here we've got the problem where all of our separators essentially saying that points in the middle are, like this separator says it's not C, this separator says it's not A, and this separator says it's not B. So this is essentially a no man's land, okay? So, so there's, there's essentially no support vector machine that is saying that this point belongs to any of the classes, okay? So, so this is a problem. Okay, so one against all is not great. Okay, the next one we're going to look at is pairwise comparison. For this one, we're going to train k-square support vector machines, so one for every pair. 
So again, we've got A, we've got B, and we've got C. So now, <coughs> in this case, you see if I'm doing A versus C, perhaps I'll find a linear separator that looks like this. If I'm doing A versus B, then I'll find a linear separator that looks like that. If I'm doing B versus C, then perhaps this is my linear separator. And now we'll have the same problem where here if I take any point in any region, I'm going to have trouble to pick a single class because when I look at a support vector machine that distinguishes between two classes, right, that support vector machine will give me a vote for one class, but then the next support vector machine may give me a vote for a different class, so it's not clear at all how to resolve this. Okay, so we've got problems again. And, and also what's interesting is that those support vector machines, they essentially are trained with just a subset of data, like A versus C, would ignore B, and then we would pass this separator maybe through the class B, so we would essentially end up voting for A or C for points that are really part of B, so it's really problematic. Okay, so the last one, continuous ranking. So we have A, B, and C again. And what it will do is essentially find separators that looks like this. Okay, so intuitively this looks good, right? We're going to have a region for C, a region for A, a region for B. Now <clears throat> here those separators are not infinite hyperplanes um, that go in, in you know, to the ends, but then they're going to intersect, and then we're going to see how this arises. So we're going to have to formulate the optimization carefully, but it is possible to essentially obtain separators that look like this. Okay, so, yeah, so continuous ranking is today the most popular approach because it does find separators uh, where there's no ambiguity and naturally capture the right regions. Okay, so the idea behind continuous ranking is that instead of computing the sign of a linear separator, we're going to compare the values of linear functions for each class k. So more precisely, for each class k, we're going to compute a dot product w k transpose phi of x and this dot product we're going to look at the magnitude and then the dot product that is the largest we're going to select the corresponding class. So here an important distinction with what we've done before is that now we're going to have a separate vector w for every class whereas before we had a single vector w for two classes. Right, so now, once we go to three, four, and more classes, we're going to need a separate vector w for every class. And then the idea is that when we compute this dot product, we're going to essentially compute a ranking or, um, um, I guess, a magnitude. And then we're simply going to select the class that has the largest dot product. Okay, so in the context of multi-class margins, then the idea is that now you see every class is going to have an associated dot product. And now if we compare the correct class Y with other classes that are incorrect, I'm going to denote them by K, then what I want is that the magnitude of the dot product for the correct class should be at least one compared to, or well, should be one greater than the dot product of, of incorrect classes. Okay, so, so here we're going to generalize our notion of margin. So instead of just being the distance to a separator, we're going to compare the dot products for different classes, and the class that is the correct class should have a dot product that is greater than all these incorrect classes by at least one. 
Okay, so, so this is going to be our, our generalization. We're going to call that the multi-class margin. And intuitively, this will correspond to saying that um, in this picture here, um, it would be the same as having some uh, buffer around my linear separators. Okay. Now, in terms of the optimization, all we have to do is replace the constraints. Before the constraints were just the W transpose phi of x was greater or equal than 1, that the distance was greater than 1. Now we're going to have that the difference of the dot product should be greater than 1, and otherwise it's the same optimization problem. And here, the intuition is that this dot product, um, I could rewrite it in a way where it would be w for yn minus w for k dot product with phi of xn. And essentially, you see these linear separators that I've got in this picture, they correspond each to the difference between the vector for class A versus class C. So class A has a vector w, class C has a vector for its class. Right? And now if I take the difference of those weight vectors, it will give me a hyperplane. And essentially, uh, this separator corresponds to the difference of those vectors. Okay? So here, this would be um, Wa minus Wc. So there would be a, a corresponding vector uh, for, for this hyperplane. And this one here, um, there would be an also a corresponding vector. It'll be WB minus WC. Okay? And then same thing for this one. So this one could be um, essentially WB minus WA. Okay? So every pair of vectors like this, we could take the difference. And then you see when we compute the difference of the dot products, it's the same as if we were really computing the distance to a hyperplane that is made up of the difference of the vectors w. OK, so you should be able to convince yourself now that this is a generalization of binary SVMs, because if I reduce my number of classes to 2, right, it boils down exactly to what we've seen before. And now, if we have overlapping classes and we want to handle multi-class multi, uh, classification with soft margins, then we can simply introduce slack variables as we did before and some penalty term. And um, this is now a general uh, formulation that can work with overlapping classes and multiple classes. Any questions regarding this? OK, very good. So this completes uh, this set of slides. And next lecture, we're going to move to a new topic. So we're going to start talking about deep learning.